Thank you all for coming. This is definitely my favorite venue to have ever given a presentation at. You all are my favorite folks at Telluride because you're interested in how to collect mushrooms, um, not just for your tummies and not just for, uh, I guess, the trash can, but for science. So um, also, I kind of I ripped a lot of Andy's protocol off and put it in this, so he's got co-credited for uh, this presentation. But that's what I'm here to to talk about today is collecting fungi for science. At Denver Botanic Gardens, we have the Catherine Kalmbach herbar Herbarium of vascular plants, but I am not a botanist. We also have the Sam Mitchell Herbarium of fungi that Andy was talking a whole lot about, but I'm not a mycologist. And I uh, studied grasshopper ecology at the University of Colorado, but I'm not an entomologist. So I'm what uh, I'm calling myself, at least, a biodiversity informatician, because I think it sounds really cool. Um, at least I'm trying to be, anyway. And basically, my job is to keep museum and ecological data and like digital assets, so images and video and all that fun stuff, organized and accessible. I'm kind of the data organizer guy, um, the computer person, if you will. Um, so here, I'm going to talk about data and digital assets or photos relating to the mushrooms that you might encounter out in the mountains. Oh, that's why I'm here. I'm going to bum you out for a second. So this report came out this year from the UN, and the, one of the authors basically said uh, quite nicely, ecosystems, species, wild populations, local varieties, and breeds of domesticated plants even, and animals are shrinking, deteriorating, or vanishing. The essential interconnected web of life of Earth, uh, a lot of what Andy talked about with trees and fungi um, kind of interacting and connecting together, is getting smaller and increasingly frayed. So this is code red. The world is falling apart, but we're here to fix it, or at least try and help. Um, and with this year's theme of healing the mind and healing the earth, I think that was spot on to choose because that's where we are right now and we need all the help we can get. For that mission of healing the earth, natural history collections are crucial. They represent the specimens in natural history collections are the basis for any and all biodiversity research. So any sort of paper you've read about a wild organism um, an animal, a plant, a bacteria, a fungus, that initially, that research was made possible due to a specimen in a museum somewhere. And that's because nothing that has a name on it, uh, or anything that has a name on it, has a specimen somewhere uh, called a type specimen, so something that was designated as the representative of that species. So that's how we get taxonomic research. Any study of evolutionary Evolutionary origins or relationships of organisms comes from museum collections. They really serve as evidence that a, an organism existed at a time and place um, without a specimen, or we're even getting to the point, um, as Andy likes to say, without a DNA barcode. It's just a rumor. You know, someone said they saw something, but we can't really prove it without a physical object. And then once we start describing species, and knowing what's out there, we can start figuring out how do they fit into the ecosystem? How do they relate among other organisms? Um, what are they contributing to the ecosystem? What is their niche? And that's kind of the study of ecology. With that, we can start figuring out how do we conserve these things? Um, we're pretty good at the opposite of conservation, uh, kind of destruction, but conservation is really tough. Um, so we need to have a lot of science to back that up to make sure that we don't just kind of screw things up further. And um, the, my favorite part about natural history collections is that we preserve them in museums. A museum specimen is meant to last a minimum of 300 years. Uh, we, the oldest herbarium plant specimens date back to the 1500s, so we're doing a good job. Um, hopefully they'll last for the next thousand years, so people in 500 and a thousand years can look back at specimens collected here at Telluride and use them to 
study mushrooms uh, and what in whatever kind of world we're living in then. And then the best part about museums is that we don't lock these collections away in cabinets so that only scientists can study them. We, we collect things to share them. We make them accessible, um, and a, the internet has been a huge part of that, but also museums have, in the last 100 years, have really started to realize that they should be opening their doors to people to come and interact and understand these organisms. We're not collecting things just to lock them away. Okay, and like I said, the internet is huge in this. So digitiz digitizing specimens, um, getting pictures of them, and really just the data that's on all in people's notebooks and on specimens, getting that on the internet has been a huge driving force for creating research. So all these papers here were made possible like any paper really, I, like I said before, but made possible by uh, museum collections and specifically data that was made available online, either the, mycological, uh, the mycology collections portal or I Dig Bio is a kind of national effort to get our museum collections online. And then GBIF is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is a mouthful, but that's the worldwide effort to create kind of one online museum that has all of, all of our uh, natural history collection data stored and accessible and preserved for everyone. So it can be anything from figuring out, hey, we want a whole database of every tree species and where they are. That's something pretty essential to know, especially if you're gonna try and uh, you know, conserve biodiversity on Earth. Uh, protecting uh, how we figure out to help solve our problem with invasive species, especially under the threat of climate change. Invasive species are a huge problem because they come in and kind of dominate niches and push native things out. And then how does that, how is that operating in a dynamic climate? Um, could be just, you know, what species of mushrooms are in Canada? What species of mushrooms are in Ireland? And then this one was my favorite was, where, where are you most likely to get bit by a venomous snake? Uh, that's a paper that came out, and they used museum specimen data to talk about, um, you know, where are the places people are getting bit by venomous snakes. So here are the museum specimen records that are available on GBIF for these um, kind of three groups. Fungi, we're a little behind, but that's no surprise because it's, um, it's you know, the, the kingdom of... Um, hope and opportunity, really. We have a lot to learn there. So I've got two bars for each group here. The blue is the total number, and then the orange or red is the number with coordinates, and I mean latitude and longitude. And we'll get into a bit why that's so crucial, um, but it really just puts specimens on a map. Without latitude, longitude, it's kind of just, well, it was in this area. Um, plants, they're kicking ass. We've got 78 million plant records on GBIF, 35 million of which have specimens and insects are just behind that. Um, they're the kind of you know, sexy organisms that people have been working on for hundreds of years. Um, and of course, you know, people thought fungi were plants at first, but we're better than that. So this is just from a month ago. Um, it's probably gone up since then. And last year I showed the same figure. These numbers for fungi have doubled in one year. So good work. Part of why not only just the history of the, of the biological sciences, but part of why this number might be a little bit lower is that mycological collections, or uh, the myco, or no, what was it, uh, macro funga, they rely on citizen scientists. So who here considers themselves a citizen scientist? Awesome. I'm hoping that by the end of this, you all will raise your hand. A citizen scientist is basically Anyone who wants to um, contribute to science, you don't necessarily have to have a degree. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't, you're, you're basically contributing information or volunteering your time just to be part of the scientific process. So someone who comes into our herbarium and sits and puts barcodes on specimens they're not necessarily discovering new species and writing big, long papers, but they are a crucial part of the scientific process through the documentation 
and I would consider them a citizen scientist. Anyone who goes out and collects mushrooms and records some information along with them would be a citizen scientist because you are contributing that new record to the scientific body of data. So because the ephemeral nature of fruiting bodies of fungus, uh, fungi, you know, they're out there, but we just got to be there at the right time, which hopefully is this week. Um, it seems like it is. For those mycorrhizae to, you know, fruit up and uh, produce the fruiting bodies, it's this ephemeral nature. You got to be at the right place at the right time. Funding is a big thing. Um, typically, citizen scientists are donating their time or volunteering. They have a huge knowledge base. Um, like I said, I'm not a mycologist. Um, Andy is, but I have a feeling that the collective knowledge here at Telluride uh, Mushroom Festival would certainly um, break any record for any one person um, that, that has been studying fungi for their whole life. So um, there's a lot of enthusiasm and knowledge from citizen scientists. Um, and also these local and regional clubs. So the Colorado Mycological Society, the newly formed Fort Collins Mycological Society, Pikes Peak Mycological Society, those are three front range ones. They're a great organiz organized group of people to be able to go out and contribute um, data and specimens uh, to scientific endeavors such as our herbarium. Here's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is anyone can collect stuff. Who recognizes this photo, what I've got here? Some people. So this was last year's identification tent. It's much improved this year. But there's a big problem with all the mushrooms on this table. And then that is that there is no data with these specimens. So I would consider them just stuff. And unfortunately, I would say this tent is kind of just a mushroom graveyard. Because where a lot of these things are going is straight into the compost bin, hopefully, and not just the, the trash. Um, but to collect a specimen, it takes a data hero. <laughs> so this year, we've created this little character, the data hero. And he's kind of, I hope that he sticks in the back of your mind, or she. They stick in the back of your mind um, and just remind you that you can be a data hero, too. It doesn't take much. I'm not going to up, be up here telling you what you have to do, but keep this stuff in mind and you'll be well on your way to um, being a citizen scientist and a data hero. So planning your collecting trip. We've all been there when you want to go out and collect mushrooms, and so you just kind of hop in your car or hop on the gondola, um, maybe have some stuff with you, um, and you just go for it. And that's fun. But sometimes thinking ahead can help you find those things that other people might not see or that you might have missed in previous trips. So thinking about stuff like, what was the recent weather like? I think this year is going to be really great because we have lots, we've had lots of snow and then even lots of rain this spring. Um, so that's going to make fruiting bodies more likely to be around. Were there fires in the location I was going to go? Or should I try and visit a place that recently had a fire? Um, a lot of fungi pop up in uh, places that have had forest fires, um, as I'm sure we're kind of all aware that fire and forests have a pretty um, important linked relationship, um, and mushrooms are no exception to that. What is the survey area of interest? So kind of like just think about where you're going and try and define that. It's just kind of a little mental exercise you can go for. You know, I'm going to this section of the um, you know, Arapaho National Forest um, in this county. Just have those things in mind of like, where are you going and define almost the scope of where you're gonna be collecting. It will help you uh, A, remember and also record things later on. And then what is the habitat like? Um, is it gonna be a wet, boggy area? Is it a dry forest? Is it sagebrush? Um, those are the things that if you just kinda keep alive in your brain as you're going, it will help you um, take better notes and give better information to the museum uh, where you, you might be depositing your specimens. Okay, consider making a species list before you leave. There's this really amazing tool made possible 
by your federal tax dollars, so I implore you to all go use it because you paid for it. It's called the Myco Mycology Collections Portal or mycoportal.org. It is a database that museums use to add their fungi specimen data to. They also use it to manage the data, but really it's a place where anyone can go and explore fungal diversity. It has an amazing map tool. If you go on the homepage to explore and do map search, it brings up this kind of page. So right here, I just drew a circle, pretty big one around Telluride, and it gave me a tax account or a species and maybe gender account, 224 um, documented um, organisms or taxa in this circle. And that is, they were collected here, deposited in a museum, given a name, and either assigned coordinates later on or had them from the get-go, and that's latitude and longitude. That's what makes these dots on this map possible. A map of specimens with no coordinates is pretty boring because it's just a map with nothing on it other than the mountains and the places you are. But a map of specimens with coordinates gives you, okay, where were these found? Um, and uh, it can actually contribute to these lists. Because let's say I collected a species of fungus, of mushroom, and brought it in, but didn't ever put coordinates on it, it wouldn't end up on this map or on this list. But you can use this tool to kind of create a list of what you might be looking for um, beforehand. And there's lots of pictures on the Myco portal, and you can, of course, um, find lots of images on the web elsewhere. Okay, this is a big ask, but consider getting a permit. This land is our land, this land is your land, um, but you still kind of need permission to take things from it. So for the National Forest, we've actually got a permit this year, right Andy? Yep, he's nodding yes. Um, so that any collections made in the National Forest during this festival, we can take into the herbarium and then later on show that we had permission to have them. It never hurts to call your forest service uh, forester and just ask about it. What you're looking for, most likely, is a free use permit for mushroom collecting. Um, there's the uh, commercial collecting, and that's for the people going out and you know taking tons of pounds and pounds of morels so they can sell them to restaurants and so um, so forth. But usually, if you're just going out to collect you know, a few specimens and you're gonna give them to a scientist or to a, a museum, that free use permit um, for mushroom collecting would be awesome uh, to show that you're like, I'm really into this. Now, for, and that again is kind of a big gray area, especially for fungi, so it's not required. But for private property collections, so say you found a cool um, specimen on your property or your friend's at your friend's house or something on their lawn, in order to get that into our herbarium, we have to have a signed document by the landowner. Um, it's really just saying, I give permission for this object to be donated um, to the Denver Botanic Gardens. Um, and most museums are trying to get to this because museums, um, in all honesty, have a pretty bad track record of taking things that don't belong to them, um, whether it be biodiversity natural history collections or anthropological collections, um, but we're trying to put an end to that. So if you were to come in to the museum with a specimen that was from private property, we would just ask you to sign the form or find the owner of the property to sign the form. It's usually not a big deal, um, but that is definitely a requirement that we have. Okay, you're collecting materials. Things that you should have. All right, who here has a GPS unit? Not a ton of people. Who here has a smartphone? Pretty much everyone, and that means you have a GPS unit. Uh, a lot of folks are saying now um, that there's really no more excuse for not including latitude and longitude with your specimen data because everyone's got a GPS unit in their pocket. Um, and that does, the GPS functions do work without uh, cellular connection. A basket is a great thing to have. Uh, you can 
Britt was saying earlier, you know, if you're collecting a whole bunch of stuff and you don't want them to get squished, you can put them gently in your basket. Plus, it's like a cool accessory, your fungi collecting basket. Tackle box is an excellent uh, uh, device for collecting mushrooms. And really, it just helps you keep your collections separate. So if you um, were collecting um, specimens from one area and then went to what we might consider a different site, you want those places kind of kept apart so that that information be, can be um, in, assigned to the individual specimens. Also now with you know, DNA extraction and barcoding, we kind of want, it's probably not the biggest deal in the world, but we don't want too much commingling of tissue um, among specimens. Wax paper or paper bags also are a good, a good tool for keeping um, mushroom specimens from deteriorating and keeping them separate. One thing that you really should always have is something to dig out or cut out your specimens with. So this could be just a knife or what um, is called a hori hori, is like a gardening tool. Botanists always use these, and that's because we don't want to be cutting specimens, we don't want to be picking specimens, but we want to kind of dig them out of the ground so we can get some of that under, underneath the soil surface, surface structure that might be really important for identification purposes. You could also bring some clippers, so something to cut branches with. If there's some really cool cut fungi growing on a branch of like a dead or even a living tree, you want to cut that whole branch, um, not just pick off the little tiny ascos or whatever it might be. Bring a notebook or some data tags or slips, something to write on and something to write with, a pen, a camera. Again, everyone's got one, but you can also bring out your cool you know, um, DSLR or whatever kind of big cameras you've got um, to take photos because a lot of the times mushrooms have features that uh, once they're dried deteriorate and those can be useful for identification. So we want to get a good picture of what it looked like out in situ or in the field. A hand lens is always useful if you need to take a closer look. And then a compass is going to be useful if you want to describe your location with um, some gusto. So I'm going to talk a little bit about describing your location. So it might sound simple, like where am I? Uh, not everyone always knows, but uh, here are some things to kind of help you help you do so so that it's more useful for um, museum collections um, in processing them. So try and use a consistent naming schema. This could just be that you name your sites by the mile marker of the road uh, that you were traveling on. Or, um, you know, we were in the San Juan Mountains and then the next named place every single record would start with San Juan Mountains, San Juan Mountains, or San Miguel County, something like that. Um, including the county is important. Cities are helpful, but usually you're not quite in a city when you're out collecting. So the county is important because it helps us figure out what fungi occur in this political boundary. Use named places, landmarks, and road intersections. Um, you know, it's just like giving directions to your friend who's coming over, they might be from out of town, telling them to hook a left at the old oak tree with the swing on it. They're gonna want more detail than that. Um, so things like, I was you know, on Mount Wilson, or Wilson Peak, whichever it is. I was at the intersection of Colorado and Davis. Um, I was in the Sheridan Opera House when I collected this specimen. Using pre-existing name places will help someone find it on a map later on. When you've got your compass, distances and cardinal directions also come in handy. So I was 14 kilometers north northeast of the Sheridan Opera House. Um, so these are some examples, of, like from Larimer County up north. So near Red Mountain, north of the Poudre Canyon Road. So just getting a little bit more specific about where you were. And if you don't have the distances down, that's not a big deal. But just like north of this intersection, north or south of this place, is very helpful because it limits it down. It takes that error of uncertainty and shrinks it a little bit. And of course, decimal lat latitude and longitude, which is this format here, not necessarily 40 degrees um, and so much, but 
with the degrees, minutes, seconds, but 40.5896 degrees. That's the format that we want it in. If you get it to us in a different format, we can always convert it. But that's what we're looking for. This is the ideal kind of situation. When you're describing your location, we also want to know about the habitat. Think about what are the dominant plant species surrounding you. And this is going to be, if you're in a forest, what are the tree species? Is it subalpine fir? Is it white fir? Is it lodgepole pine? Is it a bunch of beetle kill? You know, is, are you in a place where there are a lot of dead trees? What's the soil like? Is it super gravelly and dry? Or is it wet and filled with uh, humus or uh, broken down biological material, uh, organic material? And like, what's the moisture like? Are there human disturbances? Did someone come through with a chainsaw and do some logging in this area? So now there's like wood chips all over the ground and tons of oyster mushrooms popping out of it. Or are you in a place that's got artificial irrigation? Are you in a cemetery? Cemeteries are great places to collect fungi because of all the water. We want to know what are the factors that led to this mushroom being able to grow and live and inhabit this area, and what is the ecosystem like, so we can start to understand, use that data um, about the habitat description to maybe start becoming more of a data set. You know, if we have enough information about what ecosystem or habitat a species comes from, we can start to maybe ask more questions and answer more questions about what its niche is in that environment. And then, of course, fire is also important to note if there was some sort of fire event going on. Talking a little bit about photographing your specimens, like I said earlier, it's important to kind of get those in the field while it's still fresh and alive. But we want, we want images of multiple, if possible, of course, um, multiple individual fruiting bodies from all stages, so small to large, old, uh, new and fresh and not yet bearing spores to completely deteriorated and old. We want to get an idea of you know, what, what did that organism look like uh, at that space and at that place in time, and that can be lots of different ones. We also want to get different angles, so turn, you know, dig out and turn over a couple so we can get a look at the gills and so that we can get a look at what structures might be below the surface of the soil. Usually what I do is I take a photo of kind of the habitat, where we are, then I take a photo of the individual mushrooms as they are in the field, and then I'll start um, turning them around and taking, taking them out and putting them in different positions. Multiple pictures is great. We don't just want one, as many as you can muster. Um, we're not quite at the data or the images being the limiting uh, too much yet. Uh, we'll take what you have. When you're making the collection, there's some things to do or to consider. First is assess what you've got. And we want to make ideal collections. So is this, is this mushroom too young or too immature? Is it you know, all dried out and old and looks like it's been above ground for a few months, kind of slowly deteriorating. Is your big bolete full of, you know, completely destroyed by um, maggots? Those are the things that we might find interesting but not necessarily want to accession and put into the museum. We want you to dig and not pick. So it's really important, especially Andy mentioned, for the amanitas to get the kind of under the soil section, collect some of that substrate they, that they were in. I said earlier, like cut the whole branch. If it's growing off of, off of a piece of bark or a piece of wood on the ground, just bring the whole thing in. You don't have to slice it off. We don't want a whole bunch of dirt because um, that can get kind of messy. But if it's on pine needles or leaves or anything, just bring that whole part in. We don't want just the mushroom. This will not only help us know uh, what it was growing off of in the future, kind of, again, verifiable proof. Yes, it was growing off of aspen leaves, because here it is. Um, but also, it just helps keep the whole specimen intact. Be gentle with your specimens, and keep them separate and with their label. Um, this is a good picture of keeping specimens separate, but they don't need to have a label. I'm just assuming that this person was using a notebook. When you're preserving your specimens, um, there's a few tips. 
If they're large, it's okay to cut them in half. That will help the drying process. If they're small or medium or not that big and you can fit them in your dryer if you've got one, you can keep them whole. What we're looking for is very low heat and just a constant airflow. That will um, dry them out and especially with low heat, um, help preserve the DNA if we wanna do some sort of DNA extraction from the specimens. And once they're fully dry, it is then okay to put it in a plastic Ziploc bag. And this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, the museum community. It's from an ornithologist, and it's, never put a specimen away unlabeled, not even for an hour. You may forget it or die. <laughs> we're constantly in the museum. We're always writing down what we're doing and how we're doing it because the if I get hit by a bus situation is brought up on like a daily routine. I'm doing a whole lot of goofy stuff with computers so that we can get this data out of the cabinets and onto the internet. If I get hit by a bus and there's no documentation of how I was doing that, going forward is going to be difficult for the rest of the community, for the museum itself, figuring out what goofy things I was doing. Um, so always keep the label or the tag with the specimen um, because you might forget or die. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about a new, well, newish tool. Um, it's called iNaturalist, and it's a phone app, or an online app. It's also on your computers. Um, basically, it's, I would say, a 21st century solution to a lot of the data recording problems that we had. Um, it's kind of a social network type thing where you can look at other people's uh, observations and like you can even I think like them or help them identify them is probably a little bit more useful but um, it's really just for sharing biodiversity data that you or anyone can collect in their backyard at the top of a mountain wherever you are and it was developed at the California Academy of Sciences and now is partnering with the National Geographic Society and it's this really cool tool this is a map of uh, all the observations from my naturalist in the world so Pretty good coverage. Um, currently, there are 23 million observations on there, representing 214,000 species. And that's from 87,000 people. And uh, just about over a half a million people have helped identify, or no, excuse me, 87,000 people have been identifying them, and over a half a million people have been making those observations. I was like, wow, that doesn't make sense. but. Of those 23 million, 1.1 million of them are fungi. And that, again, is more than double what it was one year ago. So we're doing good. Uh, more people are uh, using, using the tools that we have to put mushroom data online, at least. And again, these are from about a month ago, these numbers. So I'm sure it's even more now. So how to use this app, it's really simple, but I just wanna go through a few of the setup things. So it works on your iPhone or your Android. You just download the app, set up a profile like you would for kind of any social media thing, and then you can just start taking pictures. You can start taking pictures with the app or just with your camera. Um, even with a digital camera that isn't your phone, you can start taking pictures. Later on, you'd have to add them to the app, but that's actually pretty easy to do. If you were to use just the app, you, you hit this kind of plus button right here, or I think it's a little camera on the iPhone. Um, and then you can start taking the photos or it'll ask you, do you have these in your camera roll already? So you add the images, which is a, a good crucial part of what we want as far as when we're asking for you to contribute a specimen. It helps you identify the species. I think this is one of the more popular aspects of this app, especially in the mushroom community, even though it might be not quite as helpful or accurate, but it's got an artificial uh, intelligence portion that actually looks at your picture and will give you suggestions of what it may be. It might not always be able to get you down to species, but it could get you to um, at least the genus or maybe even a little bit higher depending on what it is. So you can also add what you think it is. You can take any notes. So that's the stuff about where you, what the habitat was like, uh, you know, it was moist, it was sandy, that kind of thing. It automatically records the date, which is amazing. If you took the picture a few days ago and you want to add it in, that date is in your image. It's embedded in the image metadata, so it will automatically include that date. And it will automatically include the location with GPS coordinates. Um, like it or not, 
I mean, you can shut it off, but your phone is, if you're taking pictures, it's embedding GPS coordinates into all of those pictures. And that's the same if you have like a big fancy digital camera. Most likely you've got the location information turned on, um, unless you select it to turn it off. Some people worry about privacy. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't ever turn off the location data because I want to know exactly where those things came from. You can put those pictures and then that specimen that's associated with it right on a map so we know exactly where it came from. When you're identifying them, it will offer you spec uh, suggestions based on the image, but any new record that you put in will be marked as needs ID. This is even if you put an ID on it. That's because they rely on this system of two out of three people must agree on what you're calling it in order for it to be deemed research grade. Once it's research grade, it actually automatically gets uploaded to that Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF, where then scientists use that data in their papers. So a lot of, um, I like I said, there's, what was it? 23 million observations, so that's 23 million records that have the potential to end up in scientific papers um, as, as data that scientists can use. Um, that's kind of where, once you get it to research grade, that's when you, you can say, all right, I'm a data hero and a citizen scientist because I'm contributing something that is, can be used by the scientific community um, for new, um, new studies. So, something we're trying to do, which is a little tricky, because iNaturalist is designed for observations, so looking at something and saying that you saw it, versus we're interested in specimens collecting that object and depositing it to a muse museum. We're trying to pair iNaturalist with these organized forays. Um, and really what we need to do, the like kind of thing that uh, we're reaching for is pairing or linking that record on iNaturalist to the specimens. And that's kind of the tricky part um, that becomes a bit of a bottleneck. But we're trying to aid the process through printing and distributing a whole bunch of these data tags. So it's about a three inch by four inch piece of paper that we printed a thousand, and I think we're gonna print 2,000 more, uh, depending on how eager you all are. Um, they've got a unique number that we've assigned for Telluride Mushroom Festival 2019. And you can record all the information that we want right on here. We've tried to make it easy with some tick boxes and just when you've got what you need to write down right in front of you, it's a lot harder to forget, oh yeah, I should include uh, who identified it or what my name is and stuff like that. But if you also include your record on iNaturalist, you should check this little iNaturalist record box because that tells us later when we've got the specimen with the slip to go and look uh, on iNaturalist for this record. That brings me to talking about the Colorado Mycoflora project. Um, Andy just gave his whole awesome talk on it, but for those of you who weren't, weren't here, it's the regional contributor to the North American Mycoflora project. And the goal is to document, describe, and disseminate knowledge about macrofungi, and our focus is Colorado. And we want to use museum specimens and their uh, DNA sequencing to address diversity, to understand what fungi actually exist in Colorado. And are they different from the European species that we kind of just borrowed the name for? And if you want to learn more, go to the coloradomycoflora.org. But we've set up a Colorado Mycoflora project on iNaturalist. So any specimens that you collect, you can add them to our project as you put them on iNaturalist. And that will also help us identify where your pictures are online and link them to the specimen that you've handed over to us. Um, DNA sequence data from a specimen you collect could impact the known diversity um, and ranges and of species that we already have, or you, we could lead to a whole new discovery that, hey, this is actually a different species than what, um, than what we thought it might have been prior. And I think that's the most exciting thing, is that you can hand over data and specimens that lead to new research and new discoveries. To do this linking of uh, your specimen to our project, 
Basically, you just join, and once you do that, it will bring up this kind of extra bonus form. And the form has uh, four questions. Right now it's only showing three, but there's actually four. And it's, did you collect a specimen? What event were you at? And we've got a drop down, so Telluride 2019 is one of them. What is your full name? Because really all it's going to show us is your username, and that could be like cool Myco dude 29 or something. We don't necessarily want to put that on a specimen box. We want your full name so you get the credit. And then also include that number that's on your data slip. That, that's really the link that we're going to use to match that specimen to the record on the internet. If you really want to be a data hero, you can view your record on iNaturalist.org and then pull this number off the end of the URL and put it on your tag. That's kind of a bit of a process, and I don't imagine a whole lot of people are willing to do it, but we're actually hoping that iNaturalist will eventually make it a bit easier to access that record number so that we can e more easily make that link. As you can tell, a lot of this is just difficulty working with computers and kind of logistics, but we're getting better, and I think um, as a community, we're all getting better in figuring out solutions for how to do it. So, what happens to all these specimens and their data? Well, the specimen, we might pull some DNA out of it. It's definitely going to go into the Sam Mitchell herbarium of fungi. The data from that DNA is going to be incorporated into the North American Mycoflora Project and the Colorado Mycoflora Project and actually be put on GenBake, which is run by the NCBI. Your iNaturalist record and the data from your SLIP is going to go into the Mycology Collections portal. So you're making your specimen data available online for anyone to use. And then eventually that gets ingested by GBIF so that scientists around the world can incorporate it into their research. And then my favorite part is all of this stuff is going to go to Andy's brain, and he's going to publish a new genius mycology paper about it, or several. Um, I'm sure more than several, probably. Yeah, so be on the lookout for those in the next uh, couple years. Um, some awesome research coming out of our department and just mycology, the field in general. With that, I want you all to remember, nulls are dull, honor the code, and be a data hero. Down with uncertainty, we want to know exactly where your specimens came from, when you were collecting them, who collected them, what the habitat was like, but really it's that who, what, when, where, and why. Well, not so much the why. Who, what, when, and where is the most important thing. And for that, I'd like to thank Vera, our director, Jenny, um, some awesome volunteers, Trina, Ed, and Ikuko, and Justin Laux, and of course, Andy, my co-conspirator. Follow us on Twitter. Check out michaelflora.org. If you want the full collecting protocol, I've put it online, kind of without Andy's permission, but uh, that's OK. We work at the same place. I know it's a lot. Maybe you want to snap a picture, but you can download the whole document from that DOI um, that tells you what we want when you're collecting. And feel free to email me with any questions. And after this talk or throughout the week, please come talk to me and Andy um, about collecting fungi for science. Thank you very much. Thank you.